So today we're going to be talking about buying and selling mini jerseys. If you are breeding your jersey every year, you're going to end up with calves to sell, right? Or if you're just getting started, you want to know um, what kind of questions to ask. It's a lot of money to be investing. So we're going to be talking about that today. Okay. So it is a huge investment, like I mentioned, and to help you prioritize your goals, it's kind of like when you're house shopping, you know, you want a garage, you want a big yard, you want it fenced, you've got all these things that you want, right? And you go into it with your mini jersey at the same way, A2A2, pulled, super sweet, having cabbed before, but then when it gets right down to it, you may not be able to find exactly what you're looking for. So you're going to have to prioritize some of those goals. And as a seller, you want to be sharing as much information as possible, all the good qualities. And sometimes there's things that maybe aren't perfect. Um, and that should be disclosed as well so that you're finding the right home to fit that specific cow. So there's our table of contents. We've got a lot of information to share today. Okay. We'll start at the very beginning. This is put on by Purebred Mini Jersey Society, and it is a registry, but not just a registry. It's obviously a lot more to that than that because we are sharing information like this today with you at least every month and building up a whole library for you in YouTube. Um, you'll also see these videos shared on our website, purebredminijerseys.org. And it is a .org because we have applied to be a nonprofit, federally recognized, um, and we are the only mini jersey registry that has done that. Uh, we offer um, some class grants to help you get more education. Um, there's so much to know. And that's one of the things I love about breeding mini jerseys is that there's there's so much information you can find out. There's things that you want to learn about the calves, about the buying and selling, uh, about their housing, their feed. There's always new things that I'm learning and it's always keeping me very engaged. Um, so there are some opportunities to take some higher education and we want to help you with that if you want to pursue that. Um, so we do offer some grants for those things. I am known as Milkmaid Lorinda. That was a name that was given to me by my husband's boss when he was active duty army um, because he didn't know anybody else who was milking cows while their husband was in the army. Um, it is pretty rare that anyone has any livestock at all. Um, and to have a herd of cows was, was really strange. So um, that was in Kansas, I don't know, maybe 15 years ago now. And it kind of has stuck and everybody started calling me that. So that's how I'm known. My last name is Barnes. My husband and I are in Priest River, Idaho, um, and we've got 60 acres where we've got a herd of mini jerseys. And um, having bred them for purity from the beginning, I didn't realize that not everybody was doing that. I was actually pretty shocked when I found out that most people were really just worried about things being small um, and making milk. And when I bought a, a mini jersey or a jersey, it was because I wanted all those great jersey traits that we know jerseys for, right? And then I tried to find people that were breeding for purity and there was one or two here and there. And so I realized that we needed to start grouping together. We needed to find each other. Those of us that were interested in those Jersey traits, who wanted an actual miniaturized Jersey. Um, and that's where this came about is there was just a few of us and we knew there had to be more. And there, there are, there are hundreds. Um, we're growing really quickly and we're registering cattle constantly. So um, it's exciting to see that more people are concerned about what's in their mini jersey and not just small stature. Okay, so how do you know if you're ready for your first dairy cow? There's a few things you need to consider, obviously. Those of you that have cows already know that, but those of you that don't, you're gonna wanna stop and take a minute because there's it's almost like a status symbol to have a mini jersey or to have your dairy cow. It's like your homestead has made that next level, right? So there's a lot to think about though. Um, are you ready to make that commitment? I know I was really intimidated by the idea of having to milk every day, twice a day. I couldn't travel anymore. I wouldn't be able to have friends over anymore. I'd be busy all the time processing all the milk. Um, and there is some of that sometimes, but it is seasonal. So it doesn't affect you like that all the time. Um, you should be able to adjust your life around it. You plan things, um, find farm sitters and things like that. But before you ever bring her home, you want to make sure that you've got that infrastructure in place. You've got to have secure fences to be able to keep her in. And usually that means some hot wire. She's going to need shelter. Um, and that doesn't really matter where you're at. She's going to need shade if you're in Southern climates. She's going to need a break from the rain and the wind and the snow if you're in Northern climates. 
Um, and even in the summer in a northern climate, it can get very hot. So you need some shelter for her to get out of the weather, um, especially for a calf when they're very young, they need some protection. You need somewhere to store your feed. And if you're going to be using straw for bedding, you're going to need a place to keep that stored as well. You want to keep probably at least three months. Um, we try to keep a year of feed at a time for the whole herd. So that takes up some space, obviously. So you've got to have that planned. And you need to be protecting that, all that investment in your feed, um, your grain, your minerals, all that needs to be protected from any livestock that you have on your property. If they escape a fence, you don't want them getting into grains and things and bloating and getting sick. Um, you don't want rodents getting in and fouling it so you can't use it anymore. Another thing to consider is if you should start with a calf or with a cow. And we do have a blog post written by Sabrina Massey about that. She's on our board of directors. Um, so I've, I've got that title there for you that you can go find that on our website. It's in the blog um, under the resources tab. So if you start with a cow, usually she's calved before. She'll be over three years old. Um, she knows what she's doing. Hopefully she's a great mom. Um, the seller or the buyer should know those those things. You should disclose that if she's not a good mom. Um, and if you're buying, you want to know if she's been a good mom, if she's been allowed to raise her calves before. Those are questions that you're going to want to ask. Um, some people will pull the calves and they'll bottle feed them so they don't even know if their cow is a good mom or not. Um, and if that's something that you plan to do to calf share, to have your cows raise their calves, then those are questions you want to be asking ahead of time. Um, a cow that's older, there's a chance that she could have been exposed, um, if she's been on multiple farms, she could have been exposed to diseases during that time. During transit, she could be exposed to diseases. Um, a calf is younger, so it's less likely that they have those exposures, but um, there's still a lot of time investment that needs to happen there. There's a lot of training. Um, maybe they're not even halter trained, and so that's gotta happen. Um, there's just a lot of things to consider for what is right for your situation. There's no correct answer. Um, a lot of times you can make whatever you find work with the right guidance, with a mentor, um, some of the, with some experience, they can help you overcome some of the challenges that you may find with either of those situations. Um, if you have really young kids, you may find that you don't have the time to invest in a young calf um, to raise her up to be able to be your family milk cow. A lot of times people will ask me um, if they should get a young animal because it can grow up with them and learn to trust them. But if you buy from someone who handles their cattle, who love on their cattle, who treat them well, then that animal's not going to know any different than to trust people. And so it wouldn't have to be a young animal to be one that's trusting and loving and affectionate because that's all they've ever known. That's what they're going to be expecting from you too. So don't let that hinder you. Uh, I think that's kind of a, I don't know, a, I don't want to say a misnomer, but the idea that you need to have a a young calf in order for it to be a successful family milk cow is just not true. Uh, care and keeping is also another commitment. Cattle are herd animals. They like to have other animals around because they're a prey animal. So you don't want necessarily to have them all by themselves. That could be their calf that's there to be their companion. Um, it could be other animals. We've got some sheep, some LGDs in our field and they all bond and they all snuggle together in their shelters. Um, I think some people keep goats with their with their cattle. Uh, it could be that you've got a herd, that you've got a few cows. Maybe there's a bull that's in your field for breeding. And so that's the companion at the moment. Um, but you do need to be aware that they do have to have regular hoof trims. They have to have a friend with them. You want them to be happy. They want them to be healthy. Um, oh, you also want to make sure that your fences and your gates and things are protected from predators. Um, if you live in an area where you've got high predator load, but also the biggest predator is gonna be other people. Um, I have heard of cattle disappearing, fences being cut, cattle taken. If you've got ways that you can secure your cows. Um, I know someone in Texas who lost a cow. Uh, she The fence got cut and she was gone. Uh, and it does happen. Um, I haven't heard it hopefully happening recently, but um, it does happen. So that's something to be aware of if you've got cameras, if you've got um, some like high tensile electrified fence that's tall, that can help keep people out. They don't even want to stick their hand through there. Um, but think about that as well. That's, that is something to consider. Okay, the breed standard. When you breed any animal, whether it's a dog or you're breeding high-end cats or, um, or cows or goats or sheep, anything, there's, if you're breeding for a breed, like 
jersey, then you're going to want to look to a breed standard. And for mini jerseys, specifically purebred mini jerseys, we're looking to full-size jerseys. So in that picture there with the heart, that is a full-size jersey. Um, she's off of a grass-fed dairy, so she's a little smaller overall just because that's what they've bred for. Um, but you can see those traits that make her look like a jersey. And when we're breeding our purebred mini jerseys, we want them to look very similar to this, but smaller proportionately. So you don't want them to look like a big body on short little legs or a great big head with a tiny body. I've seen all kinds of crazy things happening. Um, and it's very confusing because a lot of times if there's any jersey in an animal that's small, they call it a mini jersey because they're so valuable right now that if somebody doesn't understand what they're looking for, um, then they may end up spending a lot more money because it was called a mini jersey. It could even have papers from some of these registries and still not actually be a miniaturized jersey with high percentage of jersey DNA. So that black cow there with the big red X on it, um, she is a Dexter. And if you're looking at a mini jersey that's crossed with a Dexter, chances are it could be a brindle coat. It could have pink nose um, instead of black like jerseys have. It could be very dark black overall. A lot of times when it's actually a Dexter cross with a jersey, they'll call it mulberry because that is an actual jersey color. Um, but in fact, it's just a cross with a Dexter. Um, and it could even be a couple generations back. But if there's some Dexter in there, that's one way to tell um, that they have that pink. They could be a little beefier, maybe a little thicker in the rump. Um, and that pink nose and the brindle coat, if you see that, that's usually a surefire sign. That bottom middle one there, that is Boss Indicus. It's a Zebu. It is not Boss Taurus like jerseys are. Um, the rump angle, you can kind of see there, is much steeper from the hip to the pin back by the tail. The pin is going to be way lower. So that is almost always a dead giveaway that that is a Zebu. Another thing you can see there is it's got a much longer face. So from the pole to the nose is longer um, than the jerseys would have. The ears are pointy and the eyes are almond shaped, not round, those big doe eyes that you think of for a jersey. So if you see those pointy eyes and the pointy ears and the, the slope of the hip like that, um, very light colored typically, that's another sign. And sometimes that hump will pass on a little bit. Um, and even with the jersey, if you look out, you can see she's got a little bit over her shoulder. Um, it could be more pronounced or maybe that doesn't even pass at all. It's kind of a combination of things you're looking for that if you see two, three, four things, chances are that it's probably not a pure jersey, not a miniaturized jersey, but a cross with something like a Dexter that will bring down or a Zebu that will bring down the height very quickly. Um, that top one up there, that red one, I think that might be a red Angus. Again, you've got the pink nose, you've got the much stouter, thicker, more muscular because it's a beef breed um, than what you see when you think of a jersey. And honestly, it's only been in the last 12 years that we've been homesteading that I realized that there was a difference between dairy breeds and beef breeds. I used to be so impressed when we would drive down the highway and my husband could point out, well, that's an Angus and that's a this and that's a Hereford. And I didn't know anything having grown up in town. I didn't know anything about any cows. And I was so impressed by him that he could tell these different animals to me. Um, and it took studying and learning. So I want you to understand that you don't have to come into this with all the information. That's why we're trying to share this with you. So when you're looking for a miniaturized jersey, you want them to have black nose pigment. The rim, the skin around their eyes should also be black. The hooves should be black, but it is possible that they could have a white hoof or some white in a hoof or two. Um, if they have four white hooves, that's not a jersey trait. Um, the white pastern bands, that is right above the hoof. There's typically a white band of um, hair there. Not always, and that changes with the seasons, but that can be a helpful sign. Um, they can be any color, so that's not always uh, an easy way to tell if it's a jersey or not. It could be anything from a pale, pale fawn all the way to black. There should be a white muzzle band around the nose. You see in our jersey hair um, how she's got that white that goes all the way around her nose. It's so pretty. It's such a unique thing about jerseys, um, and that is almost always there but it can fade away when they're pregnant. So um, if you know that she's expecting or just calved and that muscle band looks kind of mealy, it doesn't look as clear white as it should be, it's the hormones that are doing that just like it does with women. 
Um, let's see, there can be some white. This particular one is all fawn without any broken coat, but there can be some white patches. Um, and a lot of times I see that called all kinds of different names, um, but it is actually called a broken coat in cattle. That's the correct terminology. And then jerseys often will get, um, especially in winter, they'll get black on their face and the front of their legs can become very dark and black. Um, they change so much as the seasons change and that's completely normal. Any questions so far? Everybody with me? Okay. So here's some more examples of jerseys. Um, these are all jerseys that are BBR 100, the breed-based representation test. They've come back as 94% or better jersey DNA. So you can kind of see some of those same characteristics. We've got our black noses. We've got our muzzle bands. We've got um, the fine bone structure that you expect to see from a dairy cow. And even with the bull, you can see that he, the top right one there, he's got a bit of a broken coat. He's got some patches on him, but he still has his muzzle band and he still looks like a jersey. Um, he's in his winter coat there. So he's a little furrier, just like um, on the bottom left. She's also got her winter coat. So you can see it's a little bit darker around her face. Let's see. The middle one right there, she's got the black on her face and the black on the front of her legs. So she's either probably going into winter or coming out of winter. Looks like um, she's already shut out fairly well. Okay, testing options. When you're shopping, you wanna make sure that you're spending your money wisely. You don't want to bring home an animal that's gonna die on you in the next couple of months because she's carrying a disease. There are multiple different kinds of testing. The traits and defects, that would be things like your milk traits, your A2A2 that's so popular. Um, horned or polled is a trait. Um, just like if we have green eyes or blue eyes, it's a trait. So these things are traits. Um, the parentage can be DNA verified. Chondroplasia, free martin and PHA are all defects. Um, they're, they're genetic defects. And those tests are typically done, that whole group there at UC Davis. Um, some, let's see, parentage, pulled and milk proteins can be done sometimes through um, AJCA when you apply for your genomic testing. So that middle column there, genomics, that's the BBRs, the breed-based representation where they test our miniaturized jerseys against the known pure jersey database to determine how much DNA our miniaturized jerseys have in common with a known pure Jersey. Um, in doing that, they can come back with all kinds more information. There's something like 50 different data points that they come back with for us. One of those is inbreeding and they actually look at the DNA and see how much DNA is repeated. And there is a 12 and percent cap right now in PMJS for registration um, that we don't wanna cross when we're, we're doing the breedings. The reason for that is because our gene pool is fairly small. So that is expected to change in time to become lower. Um, or higher depending on what is needed by the, the community. Fertility, milk yield, health, somatic cell score, that's the likelihood to have mastitis, and then confirmation traits, um, things like her foot angle, her hip angle, her leg angle, um, utter depth, teat length, utter width. There's, there are so many different data points that we're getting when we take these genomic tests. So they run about $50 per cow and it's required for PMJS registration. And then we can take all that information and we can compare one animal to another, apples to apples, and it helps us to pick a bull that's gonna complement our cow, um, keep the things that we love about her, improve the things that we want to improve. So we can make leaps and bounds once we start breeding using our genomics. It's a huge difference. Um, if you find a cow is maybe not giving enough milk that you, what you expected, you can look at her milk yield score and go, oh, okay, genetically, she's just not going to. I'm gonna breed her to a bull that is gonna be more of a milk producer and then the next generation will be a little bit better, for example. Um, and then there's health testing. So before you bring your animal home, you absolutely need to be doing some health testing. BLV is bo bovine leukosis virus. Um, BVD is bovine viral diarrhea. Um, and those will make your cow infertile so that she can't be bred back. And those are infectious. And they also will limit the length of life and longevity that you're going to get from your cow. And then she'll have infected her next generation. So you definitely need to 
be checking for those. They're very, very, as well as yonis, very common in dairy herds. A lot of times people will say to buy a dairy call. Um, that's great, but test because these diseases are rampant in dairy herds. Um, and as the buyer, you want to make sure that your money is going to go the furthest. So expect that part of your budget is going to go towards paying for these tests so that you know that your cow is healthy before you bring her home and she starts defecating on your property and spreading those diseases. Um, Q fever is one that is zoonotic, um, like yonis. It spreads from goats and sheep and any other ruminant. Um, so if your animal has been that you're looking to buy um, or that you have, if you run sheep or goats, um, you might want to check for Q fever because it can infect your family and it's pretty nasty to try to get rid of. Um, Staph A, mycoplasma, and Neospora are um, typically in the udder. I think Neospora is in the udder, if I remember correctly. Definitely Staph A, mycoplasma. Um, those are things you do a milk test for. So if the cow that you're buying is in milk or the cow that you're selling is in milk, um, those are things that you should test for. There are lots of labs that will do that. Um, and there is a link on the PMJS website um, under resources that talks about testing and where you can get these and all the labs are linked there for you. Um, Trick is a, a test typically that the bulls do before they switch properties and definitely before collection. Um, Trick, BVD, blue tongue, and IBR are the disease, diseases a bull should be tested for before collection because they survive the straws being frozen and thawed and then breeding your cow. Got that? So BVD, IBR, Trick, and Blue Tongue were the ones that Waddle, the lab at the university, told me that we needed to be testing straws for. Did we get everything in there? Yep, yep. Okay. We're another question. Yeah, absolutely. On the um, bull testing, is that blood test usually, or how does that usually get done? With the Trick test, it's not. Um, the other ones are a blood test. With Trick, they secure your bull in a chute and insert a long, very long, like a foot and a half tube that's very small, smaller than a pencil, um, but they insert it up inside and get some of the fluid, the seminal fluid, and then that's what they send to the lab. So you do have to have a way to secure your bull to be able to collect that because it is uncomfortable, as you would imagine. Does that help? Yes, thank you. Yeah. If you're talking to a seller and they don't want to test, even if you're willing to pay for it, then my advice in that situation every single time is run. If they won't let you test, there's a reason. They probably already know that there's some exposure in their herd or there's been positive animals in their herd or they bought from a herd that was positive. Um, and being a prolific breeder, being a well-known breeder does not mean that they don't have diseases in their herd. So don't take that to mean that you're safe buying from somebody that has produced a lot of cattle. Um, spend the money, hire the vet yourself, who is, is my other piece of advice. If you hire the vet to be that third-party person to do the testing, then you are, they're working for you. You own those tests. So when the results come back, the vet has to report them directly to you and they won't give them to the buyer who, if they're unscrupulous, could potentially change the results of those tests and then give you a false printout. So um, if you can hire the vet yourself, that's ideal. But a lot of times you're out of state and things are tricky. So um, mitigate your risks. So registration, I touched on that before that it doesn't always mean that it's a purebred mini jersey or that it's a miniaturized jersey. Um, because not all the breed standards are the same. Some of the registries don't have a breed standard. Um, they do, for the most part, uh, test for the chondroplasia dwarf dwarfism defect. Um, let's see. Yeah, that's pretty much it. They're just not all the same. So you'd have to compare one to another and determine which one suits you the best. If you're here watching this, I hope that you'll consider PMJS. We are the only registry that does require that BBR breed test um, for Jersey purity. Okay, marketing. So if you're the other side of it and you're not buying, but you're selling, there are a few things that you wanna make sure that you're doing. First of all, share a lot of details. Uh, you want as much information in your ad as you can get so that they aren't asking you questions like, 
How old are they? Have they ever calved before? Uh, just those really basic questions. Are they A2A2? Um, who are the Sam, the dam? Who are the sire? If you share that information, it really cuts down on how many messages through Facebook and how many emails from Craigslist you have to be answering. So share all of the information that you can think of. And I've got a list for you on an upcoming page. Another thing is that educated buyers are going to want testing. So if you're not sure if your animals are clean, test them before you list them for sale. Um, I know that there a lot of times I've had people come to me and say, I'm selling an A2A2 animal, they're pulled or this or that and help me price them. And then I ask them if they have the testing done to prove that they're A2A2 or pulled. Um, if it's an AI bull, then we usually know that they have already been tested and we know for sure that they're A2A2 or pulled or whatever milk proteins and what have you. Um, but if they're not, uh, if it's a bull that you bought from somebody else and they told you that it's A2A2, you're going to need to make sure that those animals are tested and that you've got documentation for the fact that they are pulled, that they are A2A2. If an animal's been dehorned, they could look pulled, but they may not actually carry the pull gene, in which case they could be passing horns. And if you don't want horns, then that's something you need to know. So test ahead of time before you list your animals for sale so that you know that your ad is accurate and you know there's no surprises down the road. And um, if you want to get top dollar, I promised at the beginning that I was going to let you know how to get the top dollar for your animal because you're investing so much of your time and your effort. That breed-based representation, proof of Jersey purity. If your cow comes back being 85% higher and you can register a PMJS, meets all of the other requirements, um, those animals are the top of the top. And that would be the way that you can increase what you're asking for them for the time and the effort that you've put into your breeding program. And by breeding program, I mean anybody who has to breed their cow every year to make milk. You are a breeder. If you even breed one cow, you're still a breeder. So don't let the name breeder throw you off because you are breeding. All right, tips for marketing. Oops, and I see a little edit there. Sorry about that. Uh, okay, pricing. That's a tough one because there are a lot of factors. Um, one of the things you can do is get in touch with a mentor, get in touch with someone else who has mini jerseys, who um, get in touch with me, anyone on the board of directors and ask, how would you price this animal? And they're going to ask you the questions that a buyer would ask. They're going to want to know those details, things like um, how old the animal is, what kind of training have you put into them? How, how tall were they when they were born? Um, do you have the testing already done? Have you done disease testing? Has the dam been disease tested? All of those things are going to go into factoring and coming up with a price that's fair for your animal. Uh, and it is not an easy thing to do. So even at the top of the market, we're all talking to each other and trying to help each other price, price our animals. So um, that's very common. Ask for help. And then share your practices because that's going to set your animal apart probably more than anything else. Um, you want to talk about your cow's behavior. Have, are they sweet? Are they a little feisty? Are they shy? Um, are they one that is at the top of the herd, um, the herd queen? She's going to be different to, to manage and handle than an animal that's really shy and quiet, um, even though the shy and quiet one may actually be an older animal in your herd. Um, things like um, what kind of fences you have. Is the cow familiar with electric fences? Do you have only barbed wire fences? Um, so electric could be something new. Have they lived with other animals? Um, those are always important. Um, I recently bought in a heifer and she came from a farm that has LGDs. So I knew that my LGDs, once I told them to accept her, they would, and she would accept them as well. Um, and that went really smooth because of that. Now, had she never been around dogs, it could have been a real problem and she'd have to be in a different field and it creates a lot more handling difficulties. So asking those questions ahead of time is really important. Um, find out if they vaccinate or don't vaccinate, um, depending on what your personal feelings are, what kind of feed is being used. If you want to be um, non-GMO on your homestead, then you're going to want to know that you're buying from a homestead that's also non-GMO. Um, if you're intending to feed grain, you want to push some milk production, you want to sell milk, um, then you want to buy from bloodlines that are going to reflect that, where if you want to be grain free, then you know, if you buy an animal that's been on grain, that is coming from a higher producing bloodline, 
that you're going to need to alter your practices to be able to help that animal adjust to your practices. Um, knowing all of this ahead of time just makes it so much easier once you bring that animal home. Um, so as a seller, share those things ahead of time so that you can find the right home to fit your particular animal. Um, any of you that have been to the PMJS website, you'll see that there are different practices and that none of that is um, a disqualification if, if you're grain fed or not. Um, none of that is required for registering your animal, but it is what differentiates us each as individual breeders. Um, so ask questions and find the right breeder to fit you and the right animal to fit you. And as a seller, talk to people and find the right um, home for your animal based on her temperament and her production and their expectations. Oh, and don't let not being registered deter you because all of the mini Jersey registries are open, meaning that you, if you, the animal qualifies for the requirements of that registry, they can be registered. Um, at some point in time, PMJS expects to close and be a closed herd book, um, but that may not even be in my lifetime. It depends on how fast the gene pool grows and um, at the rate we're going, I expect it'll be 20, 30, 40 years. And that will be on um, the board of directors and the membership to vote that in. Okay, great photos. I've seen some really crazy photos where the cow is arched up funny going to the bathroom <laughs> or um, they're like laying and you can't see their udder. Uh, you don't even know what you're buying. So when you're marketing your animal, you want to make sure that you're getting clear photos that show all of the best aspects of them. Show at least one full on side shot. If it means you have to kneel down and get that direct side shot like that second one down there, um, you can see where the legs are set underneath them. You can see the top line, you can see the hip angle. Now with her leg back, that's gonna throw that off. So you wanna adjust for that. Um, but you can see how deep she is or how shallow she is. Um, with a bull, you wanna be able to see the scrotum. And that may mean taking lots of pictures to catch one like this, where he's got his tail kind of out of the way. Um, ideally, the tail would be completely gone and you'd be able to see the whole structure there. Um, with the udder second from the bottom there, you want to be able to see that it's called the milk mirror. And that's that shading of hair that goes between the anus and down to the udder. So you want to take at least one picture from the back where you've got the tail out of the way and you can see that. You can see the support in the back. You can see the teats are pointed down. You can see she doesn't have the longest teats, but part of that too is the angle is kind of up and downward. Um, so that picture could have been better had I knelt down and take it more direct on. Um, and then, of course, take some cute pictures. Take a nice close picture so you can see the beautiful eye markings, um, which the quirky personality where she's got her little tongue hanging out there. That really helps too to endear people. Um, it gets their attention. And then, of course, with a calf, it helps to throw even a mature cow, like next to a, a cattle panel or a fence, you can help see the height. Um, but calves, it's so hard to tell how tall they actually are. So I try to get pictures with a bucket. Um, every single calf with the same size buckets. Um, that really helps you to give some perception of like, how tall is that calf? So if there's something that you have that you can throw in your pictures that we're all familiar with, then that really helps to be able to figure out how tall the animal is. Um, the udder, we've got a shot here from the back, but to have one from the side as well, so that you can see the capacity and the way that it connects to the bottom of the tummy and the floor. The floor is the bottom of the udder where the teats are attached to. Um, that should be fairly level with the tummy. You don't want there to be um, like a brick wall where it goes from the tummy and then bam, slams right into the udder. Um, the udder is not well supported. So those are the things that you're looking for. You're looking for teat length, of course, um, but also that there's a lot of support there and that gives longevity. Any questions about any of these pictures or what any of these things mean? Nope, okay. So writing a great ad is going to save you tons of time. And it's one of the most important parts of marketing your animal. The buyers are going to be asking you lots of questions. And as they do that, you may realize that you've missed some information that you don't have in your ad. So edit your ad to include it. And that means that you won't have the next 15 people asking the same question. Um, share all of the best features. 
but also be honest. So if there are things um, about your animals, I've sold cows before that they just, even though they were born and raised with LGDs, they just don't like them. Um, maybe even they're mean to them. And so those are things that the buyers need to know so that she goes to the right home or he goes to the right home. Um, make sure you're giving the full registered name if the animal is registered so that they can look them up in the appropriate registry. I've seen ads where people forgot to say that it was a bull <laughs> or that it was a heifer. Um, and sometimes the names just don't really tell us that information. So be clear about the gender so that that cuts down on people asking. Let them know where the animal is located so they know if they're going to have to pay extra for shipping and they can budget that in. Um, the birth date and the price that tells us um, what to expect for how old the animal is. And then the height and the age that it was taken. It's great when you say that the animal is 40 inches, but if she's 40 inches at two years old, she's not going to be 40 inches at three or four. Um, so share that information so people understand what they're, what they're looking at. Um, polled A2, um, share the, the bloodlines. When, when people say something very um, generic, like comes from great milking bloodlines, how do I know that if I don't know who the sire and the dam are? And I can determine for myself if I agree that those are great milking bloodlines. Um, because someone told you that they are great milking bloodlines doesn't necessarily mean that they are, especially if it's the person that was selling the cow to you. They may have played things up a little bit um, and you want to make sure that you're being honest. So just share who are the sire and the dam. If there's any ancestors um, in the pedigree that are well known, let that be part of your ad as well. Um, Registration numbers, if they're on file at UC Davis, that's helpful. So you can do further testing if, if you want to as the buyer. The BBR test, um, health screening is really important. Um, calves, when they're really young, especially like under six months, testing them isn't going to be very helpful because they have all the antibodies from the milk that they've been drinking. So if the dam is on property and you can test her, or if she's been tested recently, like say in the last three months or so, um, those are the tests that you're going to see or you're going to want to have done. If the calf is older, then definitely test. Um, if you're concerned about yonis because it's one that hides in the herd and um, doesn't typically show up until the animals are older. If there's like you're buying from a herd, test an older animal that was born on the property. If she's five, six, seven years old, that'll give you a really good sign of whether or not there was yonis in that property in that herd. Ask about the udder, ask if all the quarters are working, if there's ever been any mastitis, um, what they did to treat the mastitis if they did have it, and um, how much milk they tend to produce at peak, which would be at about three months, two to three months, um, and then how long they've stayed in milk. Do they dry off really quickly? Sometimes they'll dry off at four months. Sometimes you can keep a cow in milk for a year and a half. Um, those are individual things that are all genetic inherited, so you wanna know as much information as you can. Vaccinations, last time the hooves were trimmed, feeding practices. Um, if the animal's been shipped around a lot, you're going to want to know that because that could mean that um, they came from somewhere in the South, maybe where they have a little more um, moist, warm climate. And maybe there's some parasites that need to get treated before they come North. Um, if it's a certain, like if it's a certain time of year, if I'm buying an animal, say in November, that I'm going to ship up to North Idaho and it's coming from Texas, that animal's going to freeze. They aren't going to have the coat when they get here to be ready for something like that. So that is something to consider as well, um, the time of year and whether or not the animal has been um, in the cold weather. And it could be the same going south as well. Uh, it could be very, very hot down south where if they're coming from a milder climate up north, they're going to need a little bit of help to adjust to that heat. That may mean more... Um, to more shelter, more shade until they adjust to it and drop some of their coat. Um, tell about that specific animal and what makes them unique. So things like she loves to snuggle with the LGDs and her favorite treat is kale and tomatoes. Um, things like she doesn't like chickens and she doesn't like cats, but she does love the LGDs. You know, just little traits like that that will help people know what it is that they're buying. And then I always want sellers to consider being available uh, once the animal leaves your property so that they can get their questions answered. I even had a buyer contact me once and say that um, she's suddenly getting really patchy around her neck 
and her hair is falling out. And I think maybe there's something wrong with the diet. Well, it was spring and she was losing her winter coat and she does start really patchy around her neck. And that was perfectly normal for her. And they could ask me um, because I'm always available after the sale and I could let them know that was nothing to be worried about. Um, so I wrote up a sample ad to give you an idea of what I would expect to see in a well-written ad. Uh, there's a lot of information there, but so many times like you thumb through Craigslist are you guys as addicted as I am to like looking up Jersey, mini Jersey, miniaturized Jersey on Craigslist and just seeing what kind of what's out there. Uh, and you'll see like one line, like he's a great bull. Okay. How do I know that? Has he ever sired any calves before? Uh, how old is he? Is he pulled? Is he A2A2? What are his bloodlines? Like it tells you nothing. Um, yeah. A lot of times those ads will only have one line. Maybe there'll be a few lines, but there's so much more information that you could put in there so that people could determine for themselves if this is or isn't a good fit for them and you aren't wasting your time. Um, then I tried to share some, this is a totally made up calf, by the way. So the pictures down there, I just tried to share some examples. So on the right, there's a picture of Bluebell from the side. You can see her udder, you can see her face, you can see her top line, her foot angles, um, her hip angle. You can see how deep she is. So you kind of get a feel for what this quality of cow is. And then there's a picture of the dam. So you can see the dam's udder. You can see her top line and the traits that they may share um, if they were actually related. And then that sire there. Um, ideally, you'd be able to see the scrotum and be able to tell how high it is and how that translates to then his daughters having a nice height udder. Um, there's a picture of milk there. So you can see that the cream line, not awesome, but it separates really, really well. There's that blue report, which is the genomic report that has the inbreeding and the BBR and all those genetic traits. So you know that she's been registered with AJCA and that she's been um, fully genomically tested. There's a rear udder picture. Um, so you can see the back teats. Ideally, you could see the side teats as well. Um, so there you can see on the side how much capacity there is and how well it is attached in the front. So any questions about what makes up a great ad? Okay. I don't have any questions, but I just want to say I really love this. And I've been working on trying to put together things like this about our cows, even though they're not for sale, just for future calves that may be for sale so that we have all this information. And I love um, showing the cream line too. That was a great yeah. idea. Yeah. This was not a very good one, but it was such a clear picture that it really helped to demonstrate the point. Uh, yeah. It's, it's nice to add those little details in there. Uh, just for my own records. So when I sell an animal, I'll cut and paste the ad and email it to myself. So if anyone ever comes back and says, hey, I've got a granddaughter of such and such, um, I've got all these information right at my fingertips in addition to her her files and her records and things that I keep. But, um, you know, it it's like a all of the main points about that animal are in the ad. So it's just a great place to start when I'm trying to remember everything about an animal that I sold quite a while ago. Okay. All right. The contracts and the transportation. So the nitty gritty, you've got your animal, you've got a buyer, you've got your animal sold, and you're trying to figure out how do we get them to point A to point B? And how do we make sure that this transaction goes smooth? Um, and a lot of times this is where the transaction will fall apart. Um, and I'm guilty of that too. I was looking at a heifer recently that I was really excited about, but I couldn't get transportation lined up um, for what I felt was a reasonable price. So um, those are things to talk about and you want to talk to your seller about them. Um, be clear about the expectations. The point of a good contract is that both parties know what's expected of them. Um, I've had people say that they don't want to sign a contract. Okay, well, that's fine. Then I don't want to sell an animal to you because I don't want you coming back to me in a month and saying, well, that's not the price we, we agreed on. <laughs> so if it's all written down and we all know what we're expected to do and when we're supposed to do it, and um, it just all goes so much smoother. And the point of the contract is not to take advantage of anyone. Everybody should be equitable and equally treated um, fair and with respect. So all of the little details about who's going to be transporting the animal, um, is a halter included? Is the animal registered? Who's transferring the reg registrations? Um, who's paying for the vet bill? Who's going to schedule the vet? Um, any little detail that you can think of. 
if they want to change something about how you're feeding or handling, that needs to be written into the contract. If something comes up later and they want to change something that was in the contract, that needs to be in writing as well. Um, I would expect that to be maybe either an addendum or just an email, depending on how um, complicated it is. But write everything out and be fair. That's the main points of it. And then when you get a contract from someone, that's not the, the end until you sign it. So go back to them and negotiate anything that you're uncomfortable with. Explain why you're uncomfortable and um, have a solution that you would be more comfortable with that maybe you can meet in the middle somewhere. Transporting the animal can be done either by yourself if you have the means to do that, or you can maybe borrow a trailer from someone that has that um, available to you, maybe even for a fee. There are people though who will ship your animals even across country. We've purchased animals as far away as Virginia and had them brought up here um, to North Idaho. But expect to pay for that. And if you want a biosecure load, you need to describe to them exactly what you want in that load. If you don't want any other ruminants in the ship, um, if you are okay with them shipping other animals, like say dogs, um, but you don't want any ruminants in the load, then tell them that. If you want them to scrub out the trailer and treat it with a um, like a vet quality sterilizing fluid of some sort, whatever one you prefer, um, specialize that. If you don't want your animal that's being shipped sharing buckets or feed with any other animals, um, if you don't want them in the same compartment with any other animals, um, especially uh, I had someone show up to ship a heifer. Uh, she was young and not bred and they wanted to put her in a load with a Highland bull. He was young also, but both of them are small and he could have reached if he wanted to. Um, so obviously that's not going to be okay. So make sure that you are very clear. And if you can get a contract even better, but rarely will they do that. So expect it's going to be expensive if you want a biosecure load, um, if you want them in their own compartment, if you want um, no long, extra long layovers. Um, it can be great to work with a great shipper and I've had some great ones, but I've had some that are not so great. So just be really careful about um, when you're shipping, who you're hiring, get references and be clear about what your expectations are. Um, I'm reading a book right now. Let's see, it's called the Family Cow, and it is 50 something years old, written by Dirk Van Loon. And this quote the other day, I had to read to my husband because it just jumped out at me. Buying a cow is like buying a used car. 90% of the gamble is in the person you buy from. Um, so when you're buying a service like transporting or you're buying a cow, um, that's where that contract really helps that you can trust the person because they've been upfront and honest with you. And it's all written down. Okay, as the buyer, like we talked about when you're buying a house, you have to prioritize. Is a two-car garage a, a deal breaker or can you make do with a one-car garage? Does she have to be A2A2 or is A1A2 and you breed her to an A2A2 bull gonna work out okay for you? Um, so determine those things that you will not compromise on and then determine the things that you might consider compromising on. And I've listed as many things as I could think of here, and I'm sure there's others that could be added. Um, and then go through, I think there's 40 of them here. So go through and, and write them out. Like number one, I will not compromise on this. It has to have this. And number two, it has to have this. And by the time you get down to 40, then those are the things that are maybe not as important. Um, and it may be different at different times of your, your breeding or your life, honestly. Um, there may be, you've got some young kids at home and there's certain things you want. You want a cow that's going to be easy to manage, already halter trained, that has already calved before. Um, and so you're going to prioritize those. But as your kids move out and you're looking for a cow, you may be willing to take on an animal that needs a little more work. And so it's going to change. Um, so this list kind of gives you a jumping off point each time that you're considering adding an animal. Um, and as a seller, these are the things that people are going to be looking for. Um, and, and prioritizing. So do this yourself just as an activity to see how you would perceive your animal um, meeting up to all of your ideals. Obviously, if she's for sale, there's a reason, um, but it could just be that what your priorities are at this time are not what they would have been a few years ago. Um, and that's that's pretty common too, as you're working closer to a goal.
Okay, in conclusion, whew, as the buyer, you wanna make sure you're educating yourself. Um, spend time reading, read the PNJS website, um, read books like Keeping a Family, family Cow, um, study up on what the breed standard is. And the more jerseys that are pure that you look at, the more you train your eye for what a jersey looks like. So then when you see something that is um, a cross with maybe an Angus, certain traits will start to jump out at you and you'll be like, that's not a pure jersey. Um, there is a Facebook group called Jersey Cattle and it's a really great place to train your eye on what a jersey looks like. And every now and then you will see other animals in there that are crosses. And that kind of helps you to just pick up on those a lot faster. And then um, as you're you're getting ready to buy your cow, make sure that you understand how to measure a mini. Um, there's a link for that again in the resources tab on purebredminijerseys.org so that you can measure that animal that you're going to buy and you can know for yourself. I have a tape measure I keep in my glove box. Um, if I go look at somebody's animal or I go look at an animal for someone, or if I'm shopping for an animal, I pull that out and I measure. Um, and that doesn't matter if it's a mini or it's a mid or it's a full size. I've got my tape measure and that's what I use it for. It's in my glove box. Um, and prepare yourself. So you're educating yourself and you're preparing your property. You're making sure your fences and your shelter and your water, um, you're understanding what tests are important to you and why. Um, you're clarifying your goals. You're going through that list and determining what you won't budge on, what you have to have in your cow and what you could breed in later. And then um, find someone to mentor you. I did not have anyone when I started. And that's part of what PMJS grew out of is the first cow I bought. Um, I bought a cow and her daughter. Both of them were bred. The people that sold them to me disappeared right after I bought them. They stopped answering my emails. Their phones <laughs> got turned off. Um, I don't know what was going on with them, but their Facebook stopped getting posts. Um, I tried to tell them that the cows both have and they were doing great. And there was just no way to communicate with them anymore. So try to find someone that you can talk to that can be there to support you so that you're not totally on your own. Um, as the seller, um, make sure that you're not using any generalities, saying things like she has a nice udder really isn't very helpful or um, she produces great milk. Okay. What makes it great? What's great about the udder? What's great about the bloodlines? Tell us the details and then provide documentation that trust, but verify, um, be willing to provide the testing that you've done for A2 and polled and chondro, any health and pedigree things, parental verification, um, as many things that you can verify to be able to give to them um, really makes life smoother for you as the seller. They won't come back to you in the future and um, ask questions or be upset with you. There are a lot of resources out there, not just the Pure Remini Jersey website, um, but there are Facebook groups that we manage. There are um, all of those regional groups. There's six of them for the United States. There's three of them for Canada. So that you can find cattle that are located near you and cut down on those transportation costs. Um, there is a group called Mini Jersey Bulls and AI Straws. And bulls are posted there for sale. It's a lot of bull calves get posted in there. You can find animals sometimes on Craigslist. Um, I didn't include auctions on here because buying an auction animal is very, very risky and I don't recommend it. So places to buy and sell. And then for education, there's a lot of resources here. The board of directors, we all have websites. Um, several of us do that have websites that are educational um, to try to get this information out to you. So they're listed there. These links will be shared um, in a handout that will be emailed to everybody that's in attendance. Um, and anybody who's watching this at a later date, you can get that by going to the website and signing up for the newsletter. And we will send this to you um, in a format that you can print. And I'll have all these links as well in the digital format. And then we thank you for being here. We appreciate that you took the time to try to learn um, how to be a good seller and a good buyer. And we invite you to take some time to go get to know PMJS, visit our website, um, visit our social media, email me at the bottom there if you've got questions at admin at purebredminijerseys.com. Um, and thank you everyone who was here today.